James. Um, and we'll pick up in James chapter 4. And James chapter 4 begins by uh, kind of being a continuance of the discussion that occurred in James chapter 3. Um, probably, if we were in charge of chapter divisions today, we would have maybe not had the chapter 4 division start where it does, because I think that 4 continues the thought that is started in verse 13 of chapter 3, where, um, where James is talking about um, worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom and wisdom that is above. And James 4 begins with a question. Um, and and he, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Um, there are a number of ways that comes out in the different translations. Some say quarrels and wars. Um, but it's an, it's an attention-getting question. And if you read back in, contact, in context with chapter 3, you see that these quarrels and these fights are likely flowing from worldly wisdom. Um, if you look at the end of chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, he says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. And as we get into chapter 4, especially the early verses of chapter 4, you're going to see this theme of self. You're going to see this idea of, of selfishness, of jealousy, of covetousness. And we'll see where some of the problems from that come against. Um, in fact, the word covet that's used in chapter 2 of verse 4 is the same word that James uses in chapter 3, verses 14 and 16. Um, and they're just translated as envy in that, those instances. And James illustrates in chapter 4 the disorder and the evil that's going to be a result of selfish ambition that's talked about in chapter 3. So this morning as we go through this study, we are going to look at the curse or the problems of worldliness, the cause of worldliness, and the cure for worldliness. And <clears throat> as we start, we see that James asks another rhetorical question. If you remember back in chapter 2, there was a couple of rhetorical questions that he asked. And James likes to use this because he's teaching practical things that most of us already know. It's just like he needs to thump us in the forehead and says, hey, remember this. And this is what he asks. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Um, the New King James Version says, do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members? And he states that wars and fighting come from within us. They come from our passions and our lusts for power, for pleasure, for prestige and influence, for position, for possessions. There's all these different areas that in our lives that we have passions and we have lusts for that pull us away from God and that make us focus on self. And as we focus on battling with the world, um, a system that encourages us to want more, to prioritize our own comforts and focus on ourselves. The adversary, who's the devil, would like nothing more than to divide us so that we fight and we battle among ourselves, leaving us little time or energy for the real battle that's going on. And our sinful desires of the flesh, they cause us to be at odds often with God, but within the church, because James is writing this to Christians, it a lot of times causes us to become at odds with one another. Um, there are a lot of churches that have problems because of pride, because of selfish ambition, because of people that just cannot put somebody else first. Um, the church where my parents attend, and uh, if you're recording this, you may want to just kind of delete this part. And I'm just kidding. Um, the church where my parents attend about six years ago, maybe it's been seven years ago now, they had, I wouldn't call it a split, but they had four or five families leave over an argument that happened between two individual families in the church over Facebook. It was something that they just couldn't settle, too strong-willed, self-reliant, 
selfish people that had a conflict with one another and they took sides on either side and the ones that didn't like what was going on, they left and the others stayed. And that's just an example of what worldliness causes problems with when we start putting ourself first instead of looking at others. And that's the kind of problem that can occur inside of the church. And it's, it's a sad thing to think about because I think God cringes every time we let something like that happen. Um, all of us desiring things for ourselves, looking out for ourselves, trying to make sure we're taken care of, um, often causes quarrels and wars within the church. And this is what James is warning about. And James' concern is that because of those desires, those lusts, those passions, those selfish things that we do, that we become at odds with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's not talking about doctrinal battles. He's not talking about battles over the truth, the scripture. He's talking about the petty little things that we all have as our pet projects that think, make us think that we're a little bit more important or that our idea is more important than someone else. And James' emphasis is not as much on the war and the conflict that it causes as it is the things that lead to those quarrels, those passions, and those desires. And James tells us that friendship with the world causes conflict with others, conflict within ourselves, and ultimately conflict with God. And he gets the reader's attention by asking a question about wars, but then he concentrates his attention on the subject of worldliness. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. He focuses his attention on an attitude that the world and the problems, uh, an attitude toward the world and the problems that occur in the church and individual Christians when a worldly attitude is pursued. So this morning, we're, again, we're going to talk about the curse of worldliness, the cause of it, and the cure for it. So let's read, um, just first of all, let's read verses 1 through 4. And, and we're going to be in 1 through 4 for a little bit um, over the next two points. But let's just read those to start with. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So let's start this morning looking at verses 1 and 4, talking about the curse of worldliness. There are three battles that are discussed within verses 1 through 4, uh, or verses 1 and 4. There is what causes fights among you, talking about amongst the brotherhood, and then there are fights that are at war within you. So the first thing we see is war with others, and war with self. So war with others is worldliness hurts the church. That's what we talked about in our introduction. It causes conflict among members over petty, selfish matters, matters that are not matters of faith, but matters that are of personal opinion. And it damages our influence in the community. One of the things that we have to be really cautious of being the church that emulates and reflects the light of, uh, of Christ is that when people come in and visit and come into the church and look at us and see how we behave and see how we act, we need to be different than the world. If we have folks that are lost, that are unchurched, that are non-believers that come into the church and they see us looking a lot like the world and acting a lot like the world, it hurts our influence on them. Now, we sin and we should own it when we sin. But we also have grace, and we have forgiveness, and we have love for one another, and we should have grace and forgiveness and love for each other, and people coming in should see that. And if we don't look different from the world, if we are consumed by worldliness, we can't have influence on those that come into our fellowship and want to be, be, be with us. If we're not set apart from the world, if we're not made holy, if we don't reflect Christ, if we have these petty disagreements amongst one another, we become ineffective as evangelists. People will see that. Now, again, we sin. The Bible's cut and dry. We all sin. We all for, fall short of the glory of God. And it's, I'm not saying we need to hide those things. 
Um, I think we should be very vulnerable in our nature and how we act when we fall short of God's glory. I think that's how we reach the world is by letting the world know, hey, we sin, we fall short, but we have hope, we have grace, we have a chance for life through Christ. And if we can do that, but not act petty and selfish, then we can evangelize the world. So worldliness hurts the church because it creates war with one another. And worldliness also hurts ourselves or hurts yourself, ourself, myself, because it draws us away from God. It causes hurt, it causes pain, it causes anxiety, and it takes a physical toll on us all. If you've never dealt with some type of secret sin or some type of thing in your life that consumes you, you may not realize the physical harm that it can have to you, the emotional harm that it can have to you. And if you've never dealt with that, hallelujah. But if you have, you understand what I'm talking about. And if you haven't dealt with it personally, I bet you know someone that has that you're close to and you've seen the stress, what the stress and the anxiety and the pain and the worry has caused on them. And it can have a very strong emotional toll, but also a physical toll on us. So it creates wars within ourself. And then worldliness hurts God and it hurts His cause. So James comes out and clearly says, friendship with the world is enmity with God or hatred towards God. Um, he goes on and says that if you're friends of the world, you're enemies of God. You cannot live as a friend of the world or as a worldly person um, and also profess and humble yourselves before God. And the reason being is when we're worldly, we're doing things our way. We're saying it's my will be done and my name be praised. It's not about God. We make it about ourselves. And this is where we realize hostility toward one another. And it's really a evidence of hostility towards God. And James, if you look in verse 4, look how he addresses, and he's writing this to Christians. He's writing this to Jewish Christians. He says to them, you adulterous people. He compares it to adultery. He, he, he likens worldliness to adultery. We are choosing someone else, something else over God. We're breaking our covenant relationship with Him. Um, and it means that we're exalting the things of the world over the things of God. And as we talk about worldly this, worldliness this morning, let us not forget that while worldliness obviously involves all forms of immorality, I mean, we're talking about some significant immoral sins. It also refers, though, to a much more dangerous attitude toward this world that can slowly but surely destroy our relationship with God. So it's not just these bold worldly sins that we have to worry about. It's an attitude of, well, I can, I can stick my toe in the water of the world and be okay, and I can go and put myself in this environment and I'll be okay. Because slowly but surely we're dulled to the world and we slowly slip away from God and into worldly patterns. And to me, that's more dangerous to Christians than the highly immoral sins that we all think about when we think of worldliness. Because as Christians, we know we don't need to go out and do certain things and we believe that and we slip up from time to time and we do those things but it's really easy to go and put ourselves into worldly situations and let the world start to influence how we think and how we behave. And we've got to be really careful with that as well because you start changing what feels normal. So, you know, you become a Christian, you start walking with Christ, you're fired up, you do everything you can to separate yourself from worldliness. We pray more, we study more, then as time goes on, the influence of the world affects us and we pray less and we study less and we dabble in worldly things. And before you know it, this normal that we created at our time of renewal, at our time of salvation, starts to look a little bit different. And that type of worldliness is damaging to us as well, probably more so than the big, large, immoral things that we all know we have to avoid. But they can lead to that because we become warped, we become... Uh, jaded, and we become uh, affected by the world. So next, the cause of worldliness. And the cause of worldliness comes through the first four verses. We'll throw verse 5 in it again. 
Um, we're not going to go through and read it again because we've read it once. Um, the opening verses in this chapter, though, help to define the cause of worldliness. Listen to the emphasis. In fact, I think we are going to read it again. As we read it, listen to the emphasis on self in these passages. We're just going to read one through four. And I want you to listen and pay attention to the words you and your. It's in here a bunch. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? If you want to, keep your finger up and count how many times you see you and your. What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So we're, we're one verse in. There's three personal proton pronouns pointing towards us. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So, in the ESV, I counted 14 times that the term you or your is used in those first four verses. So the first cause of worldliness that we think about is the self. The emphasis becomes to be on the self. All that is necessary to become a worldly person is to elevate yourself to want things for yourself, to seek passion and pleasure and worldly desires. And that's what he's talking about in verses 1 and 2. You desire and you have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And he says at the end of verse 1 that it's your passions that are at war within you. Um, worldly desires. We begin to elevate ourself above God, and the self-seeking person will stop at nothing to satisfy desire. Um, he uses a word picture. He says, you murder, you fight, and you quarrel. And these words paint a picture of how we act when we, see our, when we seek our own desires. And I think back to what Christ taught in the Sermon on the Mount, um, because I don't think he's talking about literal war, and he's not talking about literal murder here. But figuratively, he's talking about the way we act when we seek our own desires. And I think back to what Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. It's 21 and 22. He says, you have, heard it, uh, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. I think it's this idea of when we let our desires get in the way, we're liable to judgment because of how we act to our fellow brothers. And sinful desires are dangerous. All conflict comes from desires that are within us and desires that are motivated by a longing for earthly pleasure. And James tells the brethren, you do not have because you do not ask. He tells them that you're not even seeking God for help and guidance, etc. He says they only think of themselves in prayers. So James points out to the brethren that even in their prayers they were self-centered. You know, Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 9, he tells us to seek what is best in, for the sake of God's name. He, he tells us to pray for God's will be done and not ours. But friendship with the world, worldliness teaches us to say, my will be done and make my name great. In James, verse, in verse 3, it's like he anticipates a reaction to the comment at the end of verse 2. So he says, you do not have because you do not ask. In James, in verse 3, it's almost like he, he throws out a, a qualifying statement because he anticipates a question that someone's going to ask. Um, and you can imagine, and I know I would probably say this myself, um, James saying, well... You, you, you don't have because you don't ask and saying, what well, I did ask God. I did pray for this. I did pray for a certain outcome or a certain thing, and I was just ignored. It was, there was no answer. Um, and in response to that, James anticipates that question, and his response is that when you do ask, you're act, asking with wrong motives, and he tells them that if they ask to fulfill their own desires their own passions that they're not going to receive. And he goes on to say that the purpose of prayer is, or the idea is that the purpose of prayer is not so much to get our will done in heaven, uh, 
but it is to get God's will done on earth. And if we're using our prayer to focus on our own needs, our own desires, our, and I'm going to say our needs, but our own wants, our own desires, our own passions, then we're praying with the wrong motives and, and we're not going to find the answers that we need. Um, in verse 4, he says that we allow ourselves to be deceived by the world. And James gets to the heart of the problem in this verse. He shows us that friendship with the world results in spiritual adultery against God. So multiple times the church is described as the bride of Christ. And we as Christians and the individuals within the church, um, we make up the church. When we choose the desires and the lusts of the world over God, James is telling us that we're committing adultery against him. Um, that we're breaking our covenant bond with him, that we're unfaithful to him, that we've become enemies to him. And James places the world on one side and he places God on the other side. And these two sides are diametrically opposed. You, you can't put a foot in one and a foot in the other. You have to pick, am I on this side or that side? And James is saying, um, that they're on complete opposite sides of the spectrum and you cannot love them both and you cannot serve them both. And we know Matthew 6, 24, still in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ says we cannot serve two masters. And that's true. And if we claim to be Christ's, if we have gone through the obedience and the covenant of going through baptism and, and finding salvation through Him, then we've chose that we're going to be on his side of that, that, that chasm. And if we step to the other side, if we're enticed by the world and we give in to worldliness, then it's like we're cheating on God. And he takes that very, very, very personally, as any of us would if we're in that situation. Satan does not mind divided loyalty, though. Our enemy, the devil, he's great with it. He wants you to think, you know what? I can have a foot in God and I can have a foot in the world and I'm great. He encourages that because if he can make you believe that, he's won. But God, of course, opposes that. Um, God says you have to choose. You're either in the world or you're in me and there's no in between. And in our culture and even in the church, we have... Um, we have found that the pleasures of this world um, draw us away from Him. We have satisfied our flesh with things of the world, with more possessions, with nicer cars, with more luxuries. We've pursued, we've pursued positions and popularity. We've lived for what is best for us in this world. And in that process, we've cheated on God. We've committed adultery towards Him. And the only way we recover is to submit ourselves to Him, to become obedient to Him, to repent and learn to come back to Him. And thank goodness in verses 5 through 10, James turns around a bleak situation that we put ourselves in and he gives us the cure for worldliness. In James 4, 5... Yeah. That's right. Oh no. This time, folks, the idea has come up oh, no. that Christ has taught against it. Yep. It goes on and on throughout. Well, and the fact that James addresses it in this very practical guide to Christianity tells us that it was just as big of a problem then as it is now. Um, and it's left here through eternity for us to study it and to learn from it because it's a problem that we've always had, we're having now and we're going to have in the future. I mean, Adam and Eve got deceived and thought, you know what, we can go ahead and try to do this. And instantly they sinned and they fell because they chose, we're going to do what we want to do. We want to do what we've been encouraged by Satan to do. And we're going to step away from what God told us. And it, that problem's been going on ever since. And that's why I said if Satan can get us to believe it's okay to have one foot in God and one foot in the world, he wins. That's his goal. 
because then we kind of feel like, well, we're okay. We're better than so-and-so. We're not doing all of this stuff. But God says you choose one or the other. You either choose God or you choose the world. There's no in-between. Um, so in James 4, 5, um, let's read it. This is James. He says, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says, He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us? James, in this passage, reminds us that God is a jealous God, that He yearns for us, that He wants us to be a part of Him. He doesn't force us. He's not going to cause us and compel us to follow Him, but He asks us to, and He waits for us to, and He wants us to. Um, and it's not a new concept. If you go back and you look in Exodus 20 and you read Exodus 34, it's Exodus 25 and Exodus 34, 14 through 16, it's pretty cut and dry that God is a jealous God, that God wants us to be turned to Him, that God wants us to give Him the glory, to give Him the attention, and that He yearns for us to do that. Again, He doesn't force us. He doesn't compel us. He never will because He wants us to have free choice. He wants us to choose Him, but He does uh, want us yearning for Him. In, in Exodus 34, this is as they're renewing the covenant again with the people. In verses 14 through 16, we'll pick up in verse 13. He says, You shall tell, tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their ashram, for you shall worship no other god for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. This is what we're talking about. This is God getting on to Israel saying, be careful. Choose me over the world. Choose me over the inhabitants of the land that are surrounding you. And we see he defines himself as a jealous God. So in his covenant with the people, he reminds them not to stray from him, to avoid worldliness because he is a jealous God. And it's a good thing that God is jealous for us. He will oppose anything or anybody who threatens our relationship with him. And it's not an insecure type of jealousy. It's not him being insecure. He's not afraid that you're going to go out there and find somebody that is better than him because there is, there is nobody out there that is better than he is. But this is a secure jealousy that seeks what is best for you and guards your heart from adulterous pursuits. And he wants us to run from things of this world and to cling to him to find all that we need. That's what he desires of us, and he's not going to force it, but he invites us to do that. So the remaining verses throughout verse 10 give us the cure for worldliness. The emphasis of the final four verses in the passage is on submission to Him. It's on God and our role and our response to Him. So in verse 6, He reveals to us the importance of the grace of God. And hallelujah for the grace of God. That's why I think James gives us kind of all the bad to start with and tells us that being friends of the world is being enemies with God and that, that we're essentially lost without without Him if we, if we choose to be in the world. But in, in this verse, hallelujah, He reminds us of the grace of God. Because if we only had to rely on our strength and our abilities, we would be in a hopeless situation. Because we're weak. We sin. We're selfish. We like things the way we like things. We think about ourselves first. We don't put other people first. And that's kind of our nature. That's kind of um, how we are because we are of the flesh and we live in a fallen world um, and we choose to root for ourselves. So hallelujah that we don't have to rely on our own strength and our own abilities for salvation because if we did that, we'd fail. I mean, it would be a very lonely place in heaven. But thank God for His grace. James reminds us that God gives more grace and it's through grace that we've been saved. We know it says that in Ephesians 2.8. But His grace does not cease once we're Christians. That's the great thing. So through the grace of God, Christ came. He died on the cross. And if we obey Him and if we follow Him and if we follow the commandments in the New Testament, uh, 
we can find salvation through God's grace. But it doesn't just stop at the point of salvation. Um, grace continues to go and to cover us once we become Christians, and we need God's grace in our time of need. And James does, does remind us that we have a condition to meet in order to receive the grace of God. At the end of verse 6, that's Exodus. Let me go back over here to James. At the end of verse 6, he says, he actually quotes, after saying that he gives more grace, he says, therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So there's a condition here. And God will give us grace. He's shown us grace, and that is fact. But if we're prideful, if we put ourselves first, if we don't humble ourselves to Him, and we don't humble ourselves and bend ourselves and submit ourselves to His will, then we remove ourselves from His grace. His grace is still there. He offers it to us. It's just that we choose not to accept it, that we turn our backs on it. It's kind of like if somebody gives you a gift and you go, you know what, I really don't want that. That's what we're doing um, when we are prideful and we rely on ourself. Um, he's still offering it to us, but it requires that we accept it. And God resists the proud, the self-sufficient. He does offer His grace to those who recognize their needs and come to rely on Him. And He's merciful, He's all-loving, and He willingly supplies all we need but we must obey His commandments. And if we choose to disobey Him and we, depend, we, we choose to depend on ourselves to live in the world, then we're separated from Him. And until we recognize that sin, humble ourselves, repent, and submit to Him, then we're outside of His grace. And God in the following verses gives us multiple imperative commands that show what we have to do. How do we humble ourselves? How do we submit to God? And the first one is in verse um, 7. Um, let's, read, let's just go ahead and read 7 through 10 so that we don't have to keep coming back and reading verse by verse. 7 through 10 says, Submit yourselves, and listen to the commands as we read through this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your, your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned by mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. So the first thing he says in verse 7 is to submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Humility leads to submission. Submission leads to obedience. Bend your will to His will. Walk in union with His commands. The idea, the concept is obey God. The next thing he says, after he says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, in verse 7, he says, Res Resist the devil. An important, an important part of submission is deciding whose side we're on. Because again, you can't live with one foot in the world and one foot in God. You have to choose and James tells us to resist the devil, but he gives us this extra phrase that gives us confidence in doing that. And he says, and he will flee from you. This word resist is not a passive term. It, it, it's in the present tense. It's an active term. It's something that we do daily. It's something that we do actively in opposition to Satan. And its literal meaning is a... Is a, is a uh, military term that's like to set in a battle ray against, to put up a defense against, to arrange yourself in a defensive posture where you can fight against the devil, where you can resist what he's doing. And this verse gives us a promise. Um, what's interesting with these commands is a lot of these commands are followed by a promise. And, and this verse says, if we resist him, he will flee from us. Um, the good thing about Satan is that we don't have to defeat him. Christ took care of that. Christ defeated him. Christ defeated death. That battle has been fought and won, and we're victorious. Christ was victorious, and through Christ, we are victors along with him. All he can do, Satan can do now, is try to separate us from Christ. He knows he's beaten, and his goal is to bring as many of us down with him as he can and he does that by teaching us that it's okay to dabble in worldliness and 
to dabble in God, to not be committed to God, not to be submitted to Him. So James tells us to resist Him, to submit to God, to obey God, to put both feet firmly planted in the Word of God, and that the devil will flee. Um, and that's why it's so hard to daily have that, that resistance against him because it doesn't say he's going to flee forever. Um, even when, when Satan tempted Christ, it said that he went away and was waiting for a more opportune time, and, and that's dealing with Christ. So he's going to come back and he's going to challenge us, and that's why we have to make the decision ahead of time. We're going to resist his temptations and his work, and we're going to obey God. And I think eventually, if you continue to resist him, maybe he starts to give up a little bit. Maybe he starts to realize, you know what? This guy or this lady is not going to give in. Let me find somebody else to work with. But you have to keep your guard up, and that's what we're talking about. Next is the idea of drawing near to God. This idea, to me, it seems to include in it an idea of repentance. You can't draw near to something unless you've been away from it. So if you are already near to God, you can't draw near to Him. And that's why I think this has a, an idea of repentance in it because to draw near to God implies that we've been away from Him and the idea is to repent and turn back to Him. And this command also comes with a promise. It says, if you draw near to Him, He will draw near to you. Um, God cannot be around sin. God cannot be around worldliness. So for us to turn and repent and draw near to Him he has to draw near to us because we've been separated from him from our sin. Um, and we draw near to God by becoming more like him. His thoughts should be our thoughts, his ways, our ways. And this, obe this, this requires a commitment to him, obedience and submission to him. Um, and James defines this. He gives us kind of an idea of what this looks like by saying, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. James is saying that we've got to be clean inside and out that our heart has to match our actions and our action has to match our heart. And we do this by setting our minds on things that are above and not on things of the earth. That's what Colossians 3, 2 teaches. And we do this by becoming obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, which is what Paul says in Romans six seventeen. He then goes on and he says, treat sin seriously. And we know that he tells us to treat sin seriously because he says, Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. That is the reaction we should have towards sin. It should break us. It should grieve us. We should grieve over the loss of the relationship that our sins cause, mourn over that separation that sin has created between us and God, mourn and grieve our own personal weakness for giving in to it um, because sin is serious. What's scary is that when we start living in the world and we start slowly but surely letting our normal be adjusted, we don't grieve when we sin because we see sin as, well, it was a small sin. It's, it's okay. No sin's okay. The Bible teaches all sin is wrong and that all sin leads to judgment. Um, so we've got to be careful because those who live in the world become numb to sin. They no longer see it as a big deal. James is telling us to see it for what it is. It is something we should grieve and we should mourn over. It should hurt us to our heart, causing us to change and come back to God. And then he ends by saying, we should humble ourselves before the Lord. If we see sin for what it is, a separation between God and man, then our response will be to humble ourselves before Him. James has already told us that God will give us grace in our humility, but he goes farther here by stating that if we humble ourselves before God, that God will lift us up. What a refreshing and encouraging thought to end this section of Scripture on by thinking that if we humble ourselves, if we submit to God, if we come to Him broken and hurt because of the sin that we've done, that He's going to pick us up. I think about when your kid falls down and he's screaming bloody murder and he's just inconsolable and you pick him up and you hold him close and you tell him everything's going to be okay and he calms down and he starts to feel safe and he starts to feel secure and he feels warm and he feels loved. If we can humble ourselves before God, if we can submit to Him, 
That's what he promises us he will do, um, that his grace will be open to us, that he will restore us to him, that he'll do the lifting for us. We don't have to pick ourselves up because he'll pick, our, pick us up. So James, through this book, has given us, through this, this chapter, has given us so far a lot to think about. We've seen the problem of worldliness, that it puts us at odds with God, it puts us at odds with Christians, and it puts us at odds within ourselves. And we've looked at what causes it, and the main thing that causes it is selfishness, putting our will and things of this world and pleasure and desires over God's will. And then we've looked at the cure, which is humility, submission, obedience, and a turning to God. So next week we'll finish chapter 4, but thank you for your attention this morning.